Welcome to our second November Nukipedia podcast by Junk Radio. After the Nukipedia Network news, Alice is back to tell us about Nightkin and Creature Feature, and then we'll talk to Bishop from Fallout Nuevo, Mexico. Just before that, we've just got a quick sponsor message though, so let's get through it. This episode of Junk Radio is brought to you by the Vicky and Vance Casino. Vicky and Vance. Much, much better than the Bison Steve. Take Prim Slim's word on this one. This is Agency with your Nukipedia Network News. Just some quick updates this edition about Nuka World on Tour Season 11 and the future game roadmap. Dropping on December 6 is Nuka World on Tour. With it comes a new Fallout First benefit, the Ammo Box, which works just like your scrap box, but for ammo. Finding a place to put all that junk. Well, another place in the obvious. We've already talked about the events in previous news on the public test server as well as the Nuka Arcade. Nuka World will take up space in the Ash Heap at Lake Reynolds near Lewisburg. Pat and Pete have been touring with Nuka World on tour since before the bomb, along with their other workers and robots, including a strong bot and a clown who is sad because she can't make balloon animals without bursting them. If you don't like Nuka Cola, and how can you not, Vim Vader will be bringing some Vim representation. And there's one other character, a male, we won't spoil who, returns from Fallout 4's Nuka World. And the Nuka Arcade will finally have some multiplayer support where you can win your own Nuka Arcade games to build at your home camp. In fact, much of the props will be available for you to take home and build your own Nuka world, perhaps in your shelter. If you nuke a specific part of the map, a giant mole rat called an Ultrasite Titan will spawn. This provides a Scorch Beast Queen-like experience. Defeating it promises some special rewards. Some items being teased this season include Nuka Arcade Dartboard, which they've shown a character throwing darts at, candy machines, delivery trucks, weapon paints, Mr. Fuzzies, and a new companion. And for those of you who have wanted to get your Julie Andrews on in the hills of West Virginia, the Hills Are Alive emote from The Sound of Music is also coming. And when you've done all of that, relax in your cappy hot tub. Some of these are Fallout First exclusives, and of course, anything on the scoreboard is easier to get with Fallout First. For radio play lovers, there's five new plays coming with this update on Pirate Radio as well as the previously mentioned free cam, meaning you're no longer stuck to building your camp just where you can reach. Turning now to the calendar for future months, look out for the Holiday Scorch seasonal events running between December 20 and January 3, the Hunt for the Treasure Hunter at the end of January, and Fashnast returns between 14 and 28 of February. And just in case you're wondering, March 30 through April 3 is just a normal weekend. Whatever that means. This has been your Nukipedia Network News. If you have some Fallout news or some Fallout fan news you'd like us to cover, email us at nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm L.S., and today, we're going to focus on the mysterious shimmer that player characters encounter throughout the wastes. The terrifying, perfected breed of super mutants whose signature equipment includes the Stealth Boy. Our focus today is the Nightkin. The Nightkin are the elite warrior class of super mutant, the most powerful creations of the Master's Unity. They're superior to standard super mutants in fighting ability, equipment, and weaponry. After the defeat of the Master, the Nightkin, like most other super mutants, began to roam the various wastes, often destroying anything that crosses their path. Nightkin tend to be arrogant, being the perfected genetic creations of the Master. Nightkin also tend to be more talkative and articulate than regular super mutants. One example of this is when Jason Bright tells the Courier of how one of the Nightkin raved at the Bright Brotherhood after their first battle. The defining element of the Nightkin is that their prolonged exposure to stealth boys led to significant mental health issues for them later in their lives. When the Courier encounters the Nightkin in New Vegas, there are several different bands who roam the Mojave in search of stealth boys with which to state the oncoming mental illnesses. The mental effects of the stealth boys can be seen in numerous Nightkin throughout the Mojave. These include a lone Nightkin believing that Dusty McBride's Brahmin are the source of the voices inside his head. 
You also have the Antlerists, Nightkin who've started worshipping the Brahmin Skull Antler as their god. Then there's the Nightkin at Brook's Tumbleweed Ranch, who offers to sell the courier tumbleweeds as livestock, referring to them as Wind Brahmin. Obviously. And of course, there's potential companion Lily Bowen, who develops schizophrenia and starts hearing the voice she calls Leo in her mind. A tragic consequence of this being that the antipsychotic medications that Lily uses to suppress Leo could lead to her completely losing her memories of her grandchildren. Then we have Tabitha, who could honestly be a feature in her own right. Because of their illnesses, numerous Nightkin also develop an aversion to being seen in general, continually using their stealth boys and thus prolonging their mental health issues. Their cycle of dependency and subsequent descent into madness make the Nightkin one of the most complex and fascinating species of monsters in the entire Fallout canon. So next time you get ready to fight a group of them, raise a bottle of Nuka-Cola for everything the Nightkin have been through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For the Nukapedia Pipcast, I'm L.S. Coming up on the Mod Squad, we talk to Bishop from Fallout Nuevo Mexico, an upcoming mod for Fallout New Vegas. And joining me is Bishop, who's been working on the mod. Bishop, it's good to have you. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me here. Not a problem at all. I like to start our interviews by asking, what was your first Fallout moment? Are you a new fan or are you an old fan? Back when I was 14, it was 2011, I got my first copy of Fallout 3 Game of the Year edition. I really fell in love with Oblivion, the game that came before it. And so I scooped up Fallout 3 and, you know, it didn't really... It didn't really sink in. I don't feel like I was mature enough yet to really experience that game and take it all in for what it was. And I played around till I reached level eight, level nine. And I was in the sewers and it was just so difficult for me. The ghouls were so annoying and the ammo was constantly depleting from my hunting rifle. And I just didn't quite get it. I was more into the fantasy and I thought Fallout 3 was going to hold me over till Skyrim, but I dropped it even before 10 hours of gameplay. And it wouldn't be until the very next year where I dove into it, you know, both feet. I came at it from a different angle and I watched some guides from William Strife. I don't know if few guys remember him. But he made all those guides for the Elder Scrolls games and, and Fallout 3 in New Vegas. Mm. And oh, he was a genius. He was a genius. I loved watching his stuff. I sunk about 250 hours into Fallout 3, maybe even 300. And I did every quest. I completed every objective I could. I collected all the unique weapons I could really went over the game with a fine tooth comb and I had really, really enjoyed it. However, I wouldn't say I really fell in love with it until, let's see, the year I graduated high school, I was 19. So we're coming up this December. Six years ago, I asked for Fallout New Vegas for Christmas. And Oh my God, I have never enjoyed another video game as much as Fallout New Vegas. I fell in love. And just this morning, I was playing some old world blues, you know, just, just being real cozy about it. And well, it's my favorite game. It's my favorite game I've ever played. And I don't think any other video game will ever match it for me. I have across PC and console, I have over 2000 hours registered on New Vegas. So yeah, I'm like a genie of New Vegas. I can play it in my head without, I can play the whole game in my head without actually playing it. That, that's really interesting that New Vegas gelled with you more than three. Normally people coming to this series later find that they gel better with three rather than New Vegas. 
Have you ever tried any sort of the, the older games that people who like New Vegas tend to like? No, I haven't actually physically played them. I've watched them on uh, on different playthroughs online, and I've I've gone through lots of lore videos about these games, learning stuff that really set the precedent for New Vegas and all the little Easter eggs and the nods. Marcus being a huge, huge inclusion for New Vegas that tie into Fallout 2. I really wanted to learn about all that, but I didn't have a PC until about uh, two, three years ago. So I had no way of, I had no way of playing the first two games. And so I sort of just absorbed through other online content, what those two games were about. And they're brilliantly made. I mean, uh, they're brilliantly made. However, I'm not an old school RPG fan. So stuff like RNG, it's really not my thing. So while I really enjoy the universe and the story that is presented there, all the lore and the secrets and the dialogue that's written, the voice acting, all of that is extremely appreciated by me. However, playing the game itself and missing someone point blank range, I don't like that. That's not my kind of gameplay. I, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of that kind of stuff. So. I don't think I'll ever pick up the game and play it myself, if I'm perfectly honest with you. That's no discredit to Obsidian or Black Isle. They created one of the most fascinating universes that gaming has ever experienced as a whole. So I don't think I would actually play it myself. That, that's fair enough. It's always different courses for different folks there. So with the older games in particular and with New Vegas, we do see a lot of the American Southwest. And of course, Arizona was supposed to feature in Van Buren. Why New Mexico? So this all ties into your question. I joined this project solely at first as a voice actor, not someone who was actually involved with the devs. And eventually, Zap and Vera wanted me on the team to manage the voice actors and actresses. They appreciated my creative input. I did certain suggestions and the team is... The team has undergone a lot of changes this year. The direction of the mod has certainly changed. So Vera, who actually thought up of this project, she was the main lead. She is from Spain. And recently this year, she left the team due to personal reasons. And so that left Zap mostly in charge. They are both of Hispanic descent and they wanted to bring a lot of that culture into Fallout. They both loved this game and they loved the charm that New Vegas still has in its engine. The stuff that they had come up with was really brilliant and interesting. It's very new to someone like me. I live on the East Coast and there's not too much of that Latin culture around here. And so, well, I should say New England. <laughs> New England, East Coast, I, I'm, I'm from around there. So you don't see a lot of that around here. Now, you have mentioned a number of staff changes there. What sort of mod is it that the team is trying to make? What are you trying to achieve with it? It's going to be its own entity, like Fallout New California and Fallout the Frontier. It's going to be that type of deal where it's in its own world space and it has its own separate storyline for the most part. It takes place before the events of New Vegas. So this is actually before the Legion actually takes power and holds New Mexico and Arizona. This is right around the time that the Legion is just starting to get their ball rolling. The legend of the Legion hasn't quite reached word of mouth just yet. 2255 would be the specific date that this mod starts. That's interesting that you're going with a prequel approach there. Now, of course, before any of the more modern games, there was the Van Buren project, which did look at covering this area there. And I can mm -hmm. see on YouTube that there is a video of Tibbet's prison, which was going to be the opening area in Van Buren. Has Van Buren played any role in the development or are you trying to do something different from that? Tibbet's prison, that was the biggest thing that we took from Van Buren. And that's pretty much the only thing now that we're going to take from there when looking at the groundwork for Van Buren. This is definitely going to be nothing like their, the project that they wanted to make. Now, of course, you are using New Vegas as the base there. Is there anything mm. that you've added to the game, like a new feature or something like that, that sets this apart from New Vegas? Uh, no. We're hip. The Frontier added cars, and that was some wizardry that we just aren't capable of replicating or creating anything 
close to that. We thought about adding duels, like a Red Dead Redemption type of deal, like a duel mechanic, but I, it's going to be really difficult to pull off. That would be something more suited for the Fallout 4 engine. And we're trying to keep the charm, uh, same weapon animations. We're not really going for graphics and going for a modern take on this. If players want to revamp their experience through animations, et cetera, you know, there's plenty of mods already out on the Nexus for them to try out and uh, experiment with to their liking. So we thought let's focus instead on getting our story right, on getting our writing tuned up and perfect and making sure everybody who's uh, voice acting and contributing is uh, getting good roles and putting their best foot forward. We're trying to go for a quality experience and a narrative experience. But that certainly sounds like a good approach. After all, technological wizardry can't solve bad writing. Right. Now, is there something in the game that you can talk about that you're particularly proud of or excited about so far? Yes, a lot, actually. <laughs> There's quite a bit. Just recently, we've, we've been really getting the ball rolling, especially with ideas. The story has a nice tie-in and conclusive ending. But I guess if I had to pick one particular thing, out of everything, it's one of the companions that hasn't been teased yet, but I have no problem sharing it here. The companion's name is going to be Eden, and she is, let's see, she's a 20, around 21-year-old woman with a bionic arm. Now, she didn't lose her arm. This bionic appendage can be put on and taken off at any time that she desires. However, in this region, she is called a feminine name for the boogeyman. She is a very scary and violent individual that is heavily involved in the main story. Whether you're on her side or not, doesn't really matter. She's going to find you either way, depending on your choices. Of course, you can try to find her or she'll find you. And well, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited. We're trying to take a different kind of approach that delivers the same kind of quality that the New Vegas companions offered us. I'm sure some of you have heard of the overseer and his mode. I took his companions that he made as a perfect example of how to set the bar higher. He has made some brilliant, brilliant quest mods. My favorite, actually. The companions that he has created within said quest mods have just absolutely set the bar higher than, I believe, the vanilla companions. And the voice acting, the writing, the, the, the branching dialogue paths are, are brilliant. So. He set a good example of where I'm trying to reach, especially with Eden and the rest of the companions that we plan to do. It's, it will be challenging, but it will be done. I promise you that. I will do my very best to deliver an experience for everyone. That, that sounds really exciting, the whole bionic arm and tracking you down as, as the way boogeymen tend to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, she's kind of like, she's kind of like, uh, let's see, if I had to, if I had to use an example of something, so the level of caliber, like the level of intensity and scary that I'm trying to put on, you know, Leggett Linnaeus, Joshua Graham, Frank Horrigan, those three in particular are just absolute nightmare titans when it comes to combat and people are afraid of them. That's, that's kind of the vibe I'm going for here with Eden. I wanted to create someone very, very powerful and very revered within this world because those three characters that I just mentioned are absolutely legendary and offer so much to the narrative, especially someone like Joshua Graham. He's worshipped among the community and rightfully so. His character and backstory and tale of redemption is just incredible. It's, it's really great. If I can just deliver a fraction of that experience here. Uh, that would be great. You know, mission accomplished. <laughs> awesome. Now you mentioned that early on you were involved in a lot of the voice acting there. How do you start by getting involved in that? And if someone was trying to get into voice acting, what sort of tools would you point them at using there? Well, I don't really have a particularly amazing microphone. I still have a USB mic. And while some of the mic quality may have been criticized in the past before, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You don't have to go out and get a $600 microphone. The one that I spent, that I spent, it was, it was about $150 US dollars and it 
serves perfectly for a passion project. You know, this is a, we're not a AAA company and I don't have a professional studio that I can record in. If you want to know my precise setup, I, I set up my computer, plug in my microphone, I hit record and I, I place pillows around, around my head and I speak down into the couch. So all of the material absorbs most of the sound. So I have a very jury rigged setup for sure. I don't have a lot of software that can really tune and pitch my voice either. I record and if it comes out great, great. If it doesn't, I, I do another take. How I got involved, I saw that they were just looking for anyone willing to help. And so I went ahead, I recorded something for, for Zap. I sent it to him. It was actually a Scottish accent that I sent him. Very contrary to the location and the mod itself, I know. Mm. But it was, <laughs> he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And so that's how I got on the team. And, and that's how a lot of other voice actors and actresses have been recruited. We've, we have some great voice talent in here right now, but unfortunately at the moment, we don't really have a lot that we can record and, and put out. There's still a, a lot of the world space to create. There's still a lot of dialogue that needs to be written and a lot of character arcs that need to be established before we can really start going ham. If you're looking to get involved, I'd say the last thing you should be is self-conscious or worried that you're not good enough. Because by no means am I a professional, All right? By no means am I am a 200% an amateur. And this is a passion project. This is not a triple A game. So you never know, put your best foot forward and you never know what you can be involved in. I totally agree with all that. Editing makes everybody sound good. I promise you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Great. Now, if we can just move on to the other type of sound, the music in the mod, what sort of music can we expect to hear? Well, on top of the vanilla soundtracks from New Vegas, we will have an original ensemble. I'm not sure about ambiance yet. That hasn't really been discussed. However, we already have a radio station, a completely unique radio station that will be fine tuned to perfection of the area. It's going to be a lot of Spanish, going to be a lot of Morocco shaking. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to be, it's going to be authentic for the area. That's at the very, very least, we will have a great radio station where if players enjoy walking around in a more lighthearted experience with the radio on, they can go ahead and do that. You will definitely hear a lot of that music regardless throughout the wasteland in certain bars, perhaps outside by a campfire. There'll be certain NPCs singing old nursery rhymes, stuff to the effect of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but not Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. A stuff that's more Hispanic culture. So that stuff is going to be really, really immersive and bringing you into the world we're trying to create. And music is such a huge inspiration when trying to create new ideas for this world space. So you best believe we'll deliver on that for sure. It certainly does sound very immersive. Now, before you go, can you tell us for people who might want to get involved to follow what you're doing, what's the best way to do that? Definitely join the discord server. It is called Fallout Nuevo Mexico, N-U-E-V-O, Mexico, Fallout Nuevo Mexico. That is where we post all of our teasers and interact with you guys in the community. Also, if you want to follow us on our Twitter handle, we are at Fallout Nuevo Mex. So that's Fallout N-U-E-V-O-M-E-X. We post the occasional update there as well. Now, just to close the show, we've got a piece of music that we're going to play here. What is it we're going to play and how does it fit into Fallout Nuevo Mexico? So this song is called Burn Them All. And this is supposed to be the companion character theme of Eden that I mentioned earlier on the show. Once again, she is the boogeyman of Nuevo Mexico. She earns that status quite quickly when she moves into the area. In her bionic arm, there is a flamethrower attachment that can be deployed. And she likes to burn and hang her victims as a display of warning for others not to follow suit. So this song is supposed to capture that sort of fear that she sets in everybody's conscious. 
the sort of anti-hero. Great. Well, we, we certainly look forward to playing the mod when it is ready. Now, of course, with fan-made mods, they do not have release dates. Um, mm. Do keep track of the uh, social medias there and the Discord server, and you'll be the first to know when it is ready. Absolutely. Great. Thanks very much for joining us there, Bishop, and we look forward to hearing more about this. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me.
And as always, please remember to turn off your Pip-Boy. <laughs>